situation out here because, number one, I don't really feel like I'm a warrior for the Lord. I like some of these folks. It's got up and shared in the last couple of days. And, and I want to say this too. I, I'm not going to keep you long because I know you're tired. These children are tired, and I know that. And uh, I ain't going to lie, I am too. <laughs> so uh, you got to understand, I'm on Eastern time. I'm three hours different from you folks. And, and, uh, and I'm not as old as some of you, but I'm not as young as some of you either. And it's kind of got to me a little bit. All I want to say is about being a warrior is I do things that I don't even think about. I just do them. And someone says, man, you're going in the enemy's territory. I, I, don't, I don't think about it. I really, truly don't. And then when I hear some of the things that some of these ladies and gentlemen have been sharing, I thought, maybe I ought to get me some armor bearers or something to stand around me because, you know, I'm definitely not for... Uh, the Muslims that's killing Christians and they're coming into Florida where I live and uh, I stand at Boot Hill Saloon on Main Street that is a landmark in Daytona Beach, Florida the fourth Sunday of every month we have church there I mean, no offense brother but we don't hand out tracts in cold water we have church we have a regular church service right there and I have a lot of people who question me and what I do and they'll say, how come you're standing up there and you're always saying it's Jesus plus nothing minus nothing. Or Jesus is the only way to heaven. And I'd say because this is a Christian service. Amen. This is a Christian service. I don't care anything about Muhammad. I don't care anything about Buddha. I don't care anything about hippies. I don't care anything about flippies or anybody else. I'm here to talk about Jesus. And it's Him and only Him. And if you can't handle it, you can get on down the road. It doesn't matter to me. But yet, since I've been saying that, I've been putting my back against the wall. Because you never know when one of them dummies may come kind of stab you in the neck or something. So I don't even think about that until I start thinking about that. Amen? So that's when you get nervous and scared. But, you know, we, we do a lot of things in Daytona. Uh, you know, we have Bike Tober Fest, draws about 100,000 bikers there. And then Bike Week, we draw almost a half a million motorcycles. And so we have all these guys saying, man, we want to come down there and help you. We want to come help you. And we want to do this and do that. Listen, we do this 365. We're there every time. So we let those guys come and do their thing uh, for four days in one event and ten for the other. And I just sit back and watch, and we get all the gravy when they're gone. Amen? But, you know, we, I don't even think about, you know, being a warrior. I, I don't think about that. Let me say this. And I don't know what denomination you are tonight. But, you know, when I got saved as a biker, I got saved in the Baptist church. Now, maybe if I'd went to a Methodist church or a Lutheran church, or, well, if I'd gotten one of them, I'd probably be out there by now. I'll tell you that right now after seeing the latest news. Uh, but uh, one thing about it, God put me under a pastor who believed in soul winning. And he taught me how to be a soul winner. That's all the guy ever preached about. And I'd hear those people back there, he sounds like a broken record. Well, he may do it, but you know, I'm a young Christian, and I like what he's singing, and this cat took me out soul winning and visiting all the time. And you know, I can understand, we had 300 people in church. And on visitation night, there'd be five show up. And the first thing I said, you know, I'm going to you, you don't think I'm not a troublemaker, I'm not rebellious, I question authority all the time, and still do. And I'm writing a book, my autobiography, and it's called, I'm Still a Rebel. And I would go, that, I'd go to visitation, and I'd say, well, Brother Nash, where's the deacons? And boy, you could hear a pin drop. Where's my Sunday school teacher? Why aren't they here? They didn't take it serious. Man, the dude, listen, I got saved on a Wednesday night, which is hard to do in a Southern Baptist church, let me tell you right now. And then I went to church on Sunday morning, was baptized, and that preacher preached on winning people to Christ. And Sunday night he preached on winning people to Christ. And so he said, listen, we have visitation on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. If you want to win people to Christ, come on. And so I went on Wednesday night. He pumped it again. I showed up on Thursday night. I'd only been saved, what, eight days. I showed up, and I go with the preacher on, and to go out soul winning, visiting, knocking on doors. By the way, I still do that. They said, man, you're crazy. Somebody may shoot you. What a way to go, amen? What a way to, what a way to go. Just shoot me. And so anyway... We went up this long flight of steps to get these people we are going to visit, a young couple. And at that time, I was only 28 years old. But Brother Nash, you know, he was, he was a little overweight, and them steps were so long, and he was a struggle. I thought about getting him and pushing him a little bit, but I didn't think he'd like my hand on his hind end, amen, so I didn't do that. But we finally got there. 
And he said, they got up there, and there's this young couple there. And Brother Nash said, you know, are you young folks, are y'all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Well, you're not Christians? No. Would you like to be? Yes, we'd like to be. And he looked right at me and said, Jim, tell them how. I've been saved eight days, man. Eight days. And I thought, dude, the only thing I can do is tell them my story. And I said, well, let me tell you what happened to me. About 10 days ago, somebody mentioned being saved, and there was something bothering me. And, and then next thing I know, I thought, well, I want to be saved. How do I get saved? And they said, how do you get saved? Is go down and take that preacher by the hand, and he'll show you how to get saved. And I did that, and I can tell you, in the last week, my life has changed. And I can tell you one thing, and, and I've always, it's, it's called the one-step program, Amen. And, and, you know, I know that we have a 12-step program in my church. We have Overcomers Mission in my church. But for me, it was one step, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and He took all that stuff away from me. Amen. And so, it's in my DNA. I can't help it. I've got to share Jesus with people. I don't think about, you know, being mugged. I don't think about, you know, whatever. It's just part of my life. But that's not even what I want to preach about. Let me share something to you here in 2 Samuel chapter 6. You ever heard of a guy by the name of Uzzah? Some people call it Uzzah, but Uzzah. He was a cat that was walking beside the ark. This is in 2 Samuel 6. He was walking by the ark, and the oxen hit a rut in the road or a pothole, and it shook the ark on the cart, and Uzzah reached out and touched the ark, and guess what happened? Boom, dead. Did you ever think about what happened? What, what was the cause there? What's, what's behind all of this? And so I began to look at this and pray about it. And when Christy asked me if to pray about coming out here, God gave me this message. I don't know who it's for, but it's for somebody. Now, you've got to understand what's all going here. I'm going to give you a little history lesson, okay? First off, the ark was first mentioned in Exodus 25 when God said, I want you to build it like this. And, and basically what he's saying is the ark is going to represent a place where you can be counseled. It's also going to represent me. It's all about me. So when you see the ark, you're going to see me. And he said, I, what I want you to do is, I want you to build this a certain way, and I want you to have a certain group of people to carry the ark around, to usher me around, to bring in my presence. And so then what happened was, when Moses came off of Mount Sinai, he came down with the ark, and there was Aaron down there. That dummy done built a golden cow, and all the people was bound down to it, except for one tribe. Everybody else was bowing down. The firstborn son of Jacob, Reuben, was bound down. The firstborn is always the one who gets all the blessings from the father. But Reuben bowed down. There was one tribe that didn't, and it was called, it was the Levite tribe, the Levi tribe. And so God saw that, and he said, here's what I want you to do. Build it this way, and I'm going to take them Levites, the third son of Jacob, and they're going to be the ones I'm going to set aside and they're going to usher the ark around, and they're going to bring, take me different places. They are to usher in my presence. Now, if you read the Bible, it says also the third son of Levi, his name was Cahath. Cahath. He was actually chosen more than anyone else to do this when the Philistines took the ark away from Eli's two wicked sons. You know that story, right? They was out fighting the Philistines and the two wicked sons of Eli. They was out there, and they said, man, we need some help. Go get the ark. They brought the ark out. They both were killed. The man, and, and then the messenger come back and tells their daddy, Eli, who was sitting in a chair and apparently was overweight because they told him, he said the chair turned over and he broke his neck and he died. And then one of them's wife has got to give a birth to a baby. And then giving birth to the baby, right before she died, she said, name that boy Ichabod. Anybody know what Ichabod means? The glory of the Lord has departed. And she died. And now the Philistines had the ark. But they didn't want the ark after seven months. After seven months, their golden idol, old Dagon, he turned over and they broke his head off. Next thing you know, there was mice everywhere. There was tumors on people and hemorrhoids. Can you imagine? And they said, we got to get rid of this ark. So they take it back and they give it to some Jews. And, and guess what happens? They forgot what God said. He said, look, if you look inside this ark, you're surely going to die. Do not do this. Don't touch it. This is me. This is my presence. I've chosen the Levites to do this, and no one else is to touch that ark. And they brought it back, and seven of those dummies looked inside, and guess what happened? Dead. Dead. Listen to me. God, when he, God says something, he means it. When he says, touch not my anointed one, he means that. When he says, do no harm to my prophets, he means that. When he says, don't change the word of God by adding to or taking away, he means that. He's serious. Very serious. 
So anyway, the ark was shuffled around a couple of guys' house, Abinadab and all those folks, and everywhere the ark went, man, they were blessed tremendously. So David said, I'm going to go get the ark and bring it back to where it needs to be, and I'm going to build a temple for it. And that's what happened when Uzzah, he was there with them. I mean, he was Abinadab, one of his sons. And boy, I guarantee you, because he knew about the 70 that already died. He knew the rules, but he touched it anyway, and he died. I was telling Sean, Sean's a coal miner. I grew up in a coal mining town, and coal mining area, we had shaft mines where men would go down, you know, sometimes a mile deep, and they'd, they'd go off in these rooms, and they'd, they would mine the coal, and they'd take ponies down. But one of the things was, back in those days, they had electricity in those mines, like a room would go off of the shaft, but there was no coating on the wiring. There was two bare, naked wires that ran, and that was their electricity. And k- k- check it out. They knew that if they touched those wires, death was certain. Can you imagine, and I can see this in my mind, I can see a man in the coal mines right now, all of a sudden, stumbling or falling and grabbing one of those wires. He knew as soon as he touched that wire, he was a dead man, and he was. Can I tell you my own experience? I've had my life flash before my eyes. One time. I was, it was on a Friday afternoon. I started a new job, and I just got the first paycheck. And I went from making oh, about $6 an hour to making 12 bucks an hour. I got my first paycheck, and I was thinking about it, my bill falling, thinking about taking my wife and children out for a Friday night meal. We got one more call. An old grocery store, the water line had burst. It was, it was very cold had, and frozen, and they wanted to know if we could come by and thaw their lines, and repair their lines. We got underneath there, we're in, we're in water, me and another guy, my knees are deep in the mud in the water, and all of a sudden I'm holding the, uh, uh, the electric light, the drop light, you know what a drop light is, I'm holding that, while the other guy is gently sawing with a hacksaw this galvanized pipe, because if you, if you jerk it around a lot, you're going to break it loose somewhere else. And he said, hold that thing still, it's moving too much. And I got that light in this hand, and I grabbed that grounded aluminum galvanized pipe. And buddy, I'm going to tell you what, my life flashed before my eyes. And I've got to be honest with you, the first thing that went through my mind was I'll never be able to cash that check. I'm a dead man. I- I'm serious. I saw everything flashing through my mind. And I was, being, I was electrocuted. I was being electrocuted. I'm sitting there in this old, old storehouse. And I was being electrocuted. And I heard something say, let go. Let go. Well, your hand on, on, on 220 to knock you off, but 110, it makes you draw up and you can't let go. But I had on also a wet jersey glove. And what happened was, I began to think about, instead of not being able to cash my check and not seeing my wife and children anymore, I began to think about, you know what, my hand can slide out of that glove. And I got out, and I was okay. But immediately, as soon as I touched it, I knew I had messed up. And Uzzah was the same way. He knew as soon as he touched the ark, he knew what was going to happen, and he died immediately. But why did he die? Why did that happen? I'm going to tell you why. Because it wasn't his job to usher in the presence of the Lord. It was the Levite's job. It was Kohath's uh, uh, tribe's job. It was their job, not Uzzah's job. And see, that's where we're getting confused today in the churches of America. The problem is that we're trying to let all the others and everyone else usher in the presence of God, but it ought to be the people who are called by God. Now, if you don't have a calling of God, more than likely you don't need to be touching the things of God. You see, a lot of people see what I do as a vocation, a way to make a check, a way to get a little power and a little notoriety. Everybody wants to pastor the First Baptist Church or the, the United Methodist Church of the towns. But let me tell you something. This is a calling from heaven. This is a calling. And if you don't have it, stay out of the pulpit. Because it's not a vocation. It's not about money. It's not about power. It's not about prestige. It's about honoring the Word of God. And so, here we have it. Today, we're in America. Now, I'm going to tell you today why people don't like me. They don't like her because she holds up a sign saying... Uh, the devil stinks, or whatever. I can't think of what it is, right? That's good enough, amen. They don't like him because he's getting out tracks to Muslims and, and, and the porn industry, and, and they don't like a lot of You know why they don't like me? Because I call preachers out 
on what they ought to be doing. I call them out. It doesn't matter to me if you've been if you're pastoring the First Baptist Church of Rooster Poot, Arkansas. It doesn't matter to me if you're in Dallas, Texas. I don't care. If you're not preaching the Word of God, sir, you need to sit down and let somebody else do it. Because what you've done, you have tolerated sin in the house of God. And you should be pre- uh, ushering in the presence of the Lord and still tolerating sin. And what America needs today is a great, powerful whirlwind of conviction of sin in the house of God. I, I, I'm not understanding what's happening in America today. I, I'm confused. I mean, when I got in the ministry 30 years ago, if I made a mistake, somebody called me out on it. I'm, let me tell you, you say this is simple. Let me tell you what. I was preaching out of 1 Thessalonians one time. This may have been my third sermon. And instead of calling the city there Thessalonica, I called it Thessalonica. As God is my witness, an old preacher sitting right here looked right at me and said, Hey, 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 hey. That's not how you pronounce that word. That's Thessalonica. Now, it embarrassed me. But guess what? I never mispronounced it wrong again. He called me out on what I said. But the first sermon I preached, I preached on Luke 15, the prodigal son. I preached it as a lost man. My pastor called me and said, they say, son, that's, not a, that's a backslider. You need to know the difference. They called me out on it. And that's just the way it was. If you're, if you're preaching something that's wrong, someone who loves you and cares about you is going to correct you. And by the way, if you're sitting in a church where your pastor doesn't preach against sin and don't get on your toes every once in a while, more than likely, he's not concerned about your soul. He's more concerned about your pocketbook. Amen? I mean, if, if, if you absolutely, if the pastor's never making anybody mad, something's wrong. Bad wrong. So we got guys now in America that would rather have a little bowl of porridge and a pastorum than have the power of God on them. And I call them out on it, and they don't like it. They hate me over that. They say, you talk too much. You're too hard on us. Let me tell you something. You need to be hard on because you're tolerating sin in the house of God. And we got people in minister of music in big churches today. Huge mega churches. And the minister of music, they're fired up for Jesus. And they can jump and, and, and they get around and they get you fired up. But they're homosexuals. They're homosexuals. And yet we put them in a, pie, in a position of power. We say it's okay. No, it's not okay. Sin is sin, period. And somebody says, oh, somebody says, oh, well, if he keeps on coming, maybe you hear the preaching of the Bible, of the Word of God, and he'll get saved. No, if he keeps on coming, if you don't get saved, it means you're putting your stamp of approval on his lifestyle is what it's all about. And not only that, the preacher in the pulpit in many churches, you got, you got a homosexual leading the music, and if you don't like this, I'm sorry, you can apologize to Christy later or get mad at her, but I'm going to preach it, amen. you got a homosexual leading the music, and you got men in the pulpit whose wives are sitting here and their baby mamas are sitting over here. What in the world's going on? It wasn't like that. When I came in the ministry, I guarantee you on that, you got a guy, and listen, and here's where it is. And the congregation is saying, oh, we understand, Pastor, anybody can mess up. He's got two baby mamas sitting over there with four kids out of wedlock and his wife's over here and the congregation is still embracing him saying, oh, that's okay, Pastor. We know everybody messes up. What you need to do is you need to tell that dude he needs to get along with God and get his heart right. Because the problem is there's the problem in the pulpit, not this pulpit, but the pulpits of America have become weak. Very, very, very weak. They won't preach the Word of God. They're afraid they're going to uh, disturb their little bowl of porridge or their, their paycheck. And I'm telling you, we're losing ground in America because of the pulpits. I heard a great message here yesterday, brother. This pastor praise God. When I go places, it's unbelievable. It blows me away what guys are preaching today in America's pulpits. By the way, have you ever heard of a place, a thing called the Black Coat Regiment? Go home and look at the Black Coat Regiment during the Civil War. You know who made it up? Pastors and preachers were in the military, amen. And they were fighting for their country. And they died for their country. Remember the uh, uh, Mel Gibson movie called Patriot? Remember the old preacher who left? He fought for this country. 
And he stood in his pulpit and he preached against sin and debauchery and he preached against an evil government and tyranny. He did that. You know why? Because he didn't have a 501c3. That's why. Today we got a 501c3 and we let the government dictate what we're going to do. You can, you know, I'll pay my taxes. God said, give what is to him to him and give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. A 501c3 is not going to stop me from standing up and preaching the word of God and telling our nation who and how to vote. You say, you going to name a name? No, I'm going to say this. Bless God, if they are for abortion, <laughs> amen, if they're for openly uh, homosexuality, I'm going to tell you, you don't need to vote for them. You see, my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother, they were all Democrats, and I got to vote Democrat because of them. You are a fool is what you are. You vote for someone who stands for godly principles is what you need to do. The Black Coat Regiment, they wasn't scared. They died for their country. And that's what we got. We got preachers in a pulpit, man. I guarantee you, you can go ask them right now. And some of them are making six figures. And by the way, I, I'll just tell you right now, I don't get a salary at our church. They pay my housing. They, they pay my house uh, rent and my utilities. I don't get a salary. So that's the reason why I can say sucking up is not in my job description. I don't have to because I got nothing to suck up for. A lot of these preachers have got six-figure salaries. Homes bigger than they'll ever need. I don't need a big house. I can't get the one I clean. I want me living right now clean. Amen. I can't keep it painted. I can't keep the, 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 the faucets from leaking. I, I can't keep the grass from growing. I can't take care of what I got. I don't need something bigger. But they got big houses and big paychecks and big egos. And they're trading out the power of God for the love of pleasure. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. What does it say? They should be lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. They should have a form of godliness, but they deny what? The power thereof. It's coming from the pulpits. It's coming from the pulpits. It's not coming from Capitol Hill. My friends, it is not coming, uh, the, the, the recession that we're in and decline we're in spiritually, it's not coming from the senators or the representatives. It's all starting right here because we got a bunch of mealy-mouthed, weak neat preachers in the pulpit that'd rather have a paycheck than the power of God. They're preaching too much grace and not enough truth. I just, I, I had a stop on my way out here. I stopped in a big city of Texas. It starts with an H. The big old church there. That started who has a big old preacher right there who's a and he speaks I didn't say preach he speaks to 20,000 people inside of a building every Sunday morning a million more on television and I'll tell you all he's doing is preaching grace he's not preaching the truth he's not preaching the truth I don't care how good looking he is I don't care how wonderful he looks it doesn't matter to me. He is not teaching truth. He's teaching all grace. Every book that he writes, and you can look at all the top ten selling books at Christian Books Day, and most of them have this pronoun in it, you. It's all about you. Live a better you. You are somebody else. You are blessed. You are the, let me tell you something. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Amen. That's what it's about. It's about holy living. It's about righteous living is what it is. That man is not in no way challenging those 20,000 people every Sunday morning to live holy and righteous before God. What we need to happen there is we need a great moving of the Holy Spirit to come and convict them of their sin. Or they send, need to send Mike Salmon out there or, or this brother here, Sean Wallace out there. They won't let me in the door. But I guarantee send some of these other preachers out there. And you know what? Let y'all preach. And I'm going to tell you what will happen. Well, I'll just use myself. Let's say they did let me in the door of this big old church. And they said, you know what? Coach East, you're going to preach today. As soon as I walked up there and I didn't bat my eyes like this, come on now, you're special. As soon as I walked in the pulpit, 10,000 would probably leave. I'm serious. 
But if the other 10,000 stayed, I'd say about 5,000 get saved because they'd never heard the gospel before, amen. No one's ever told them about Jesus before. They never told him he's the way, the truth, and the life, and you can't get to the Father, the other man. They've never heard it. They've never heard the word. He's preaching heresy, but he's cute, brother. He's preaching false doctrine, but he's so handsome. And his wife, she's so sweet. He's wrong. He's wrong. He's wrong. And if his daddy was still alive, Brother John would call him out on the carpet over it. He's wrong. He's wrong. I don't care what denomination you are, some you've got to see the truth in some of this stuff. The truth. Young man up in South Carolina. I don't know, probably 35 years old, got a big church, grew it up. I don't know how these young guys can build these, golly, 10,000 seat auditoriums after two years in a ministry. I don't know how they do it. I mean, somehow, somebody's got somebody's be financing that stuff other than God. 30 some odd years old, stands in the pulpit, and here's what he says. And I just happened to be watching him. And I'll tell you, the, what drew me to his attention was his appearance. And I, I started to look at him because he looked like somebody I knew. In South Carolina, got six to 10,000 there every morning. Here's what he said. You need to come to our church. We preach an upbeat, modern gospel. What? And I'm thinking to myself, did I hear it right? And he said it again. We preach an upbeat. There's nothing wrong with an upbeat gospel, amen. We, be, we preach an upbeat, modern gospel in this church. And I thought, boy, somebody needs to call you out on this because you're wrong. There is no modern gospel. <laughs> The gospel that was in Acts chapter 2 is the same gospel today. When, when Peter and John was saying, here's the gospel, you remember that guy you killed named Jesus? Well, I tell you what, you, you killed him, you bearded him, he rose again, and we saw him. That's the gospel right there. There's no new gospel. It's still the same. The death, burial, resurrection, and the presence of Jesus Christ. Who's calling them out? Who's calling them out? Two more things, not close, and I know you're tired. Two thousand, after walking deep with God for fifteen years, seventeen years, preached for fifteen years. In the year two thousand, after having five bypass surgeries on my heart, I had a major, massive heart attack when I was forty-three years old. In nineteen ninety-eight, that's the reason why I do that sometimes. I can't control some things in my body since that time. If you've ever had a, a traumatic injury or surgery, it, it does, it changes your emotions, it changes everything about you. But I was 43 years old, had five bypasses, and it made me reevaluate a lot of things. And I don't want to say, I want to praise God, I've got 17 years on five bypasses with no problems, so I'm going to tell you, I praise God for that, amen. And I also believe he's healing my eyes, I don't understand that either. The glasses I could wear two years ago, I can't even wear them today, or a year ago, they're, they're, but God's still working on me in a lot of areas. But in 2000, 2000, I don't know what happened to me. Being a pastor of a set-free church is a difficult thing. You deal with 25 to 125 Johns every day. Just kidding, John. I love you, brother. But in set-free churches... And John will tell you this. We deal mostly with people who have their hand out all the time. It never fails. Just one time, just one time. Oh, there's two things I like to have. I like when somebody come to me and say, here, brother, instead of saying, give me, give me, give me. I mean, I deal with, I deal with this constantly. And, we, and our, we, we were so small in our, in our giving because we was dealing with so many poor people, we could only budget, like, at that time, $50 a month for benevolence to help people. But I had more than $50 worth of people with their hands out all the time. And it got to the point, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. And they're saying, preacher, we don't have any heat in our house. Or preacher, the kids don't have any food. And, and it's like, man, who do I give the $50 to? And then you got the, you got the bums who come every month for the same $50. And it just wore on me and wore on me and wore on me. And I just got sick of it all. And in 2000, I got out of the game. 
When I got out of the game in 2000, Willie Amos Criswell was still at First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. Y'all know him as W.A. Criswell. Homer Lindsay Jr. was still the senior pastor at Jacksonville, Florida. Jack Howes was still preaching. Bob Gray was still preaching. Bob Jones was still preaching. Lee Robertson, Adrian Rogers, all these great men of God were still preaching when I got out of the game. And those men would have called you out on your sin. Don't think Adrian Rogers would not call you from Bellevue Baptist Church of Memphis, Tennessee if you was preaching a new modern gospel. He would have done that. From 2000 to 2005, I went back on the road driving the truck. Now, I didn't quit ministering, but I started a trucking company, and for five years, that's what I did. Still ministering, but I wasn't pastoring. I moved to Florida in 2005. Did the same thing. Started working in street ministry, ran to a a black pastor down there who's a Nigerian. He and I hooked him, started feeding every Tuesday and Thursday in a certain park. It was awesome that he went back to Nigeria. You know the reason why he went back to Nigeria? He said, man, I've been here 27 years. I've been telling the same people about Jesus Christ for 27 years, and they have not changed. And I got thousands and thousands of men and women in my country that love to hear about Jesus Christ. I'm going back. Now, isn't that something? I lost my partner, though, man. So I started doing it myself, and started rolling and rolling and rolling and then out of nowhere some cat who's 10 years older than me comes to New Smyrna Beach which I had not seen in 15 years calls me and says hey brother where you live? I live in New Smyrna Beach who is this? this is Jim Webb I used to be my pastor back in 1986-87 I said I know you Jimmy out he said we're in Fort Pierce can we come by and see you? I guess now, I was doing street ministry, but I wasn't where I ought to be with God. He walks by. I'm, this is the goofiest-looking guy you'd ever seen. He's got a big black cowboy hat on that would make any Mexican jealous. I'm telling you. It's huge, man. But he's got a pair of bib overalls on and an old flannel shirt and a big old pair of white tennis shoes. And he said, he, I got a 55 Chevrolet truck, and he said, does that truck run? I said, yeah, it runs. He said, take me on the beach. Well, I didn't live from here to the back of the, the doors. or from the beach. That's what came me walking. He said, I don't feel like walking. So I started took up, took him down there, and he's picking up shells like a little child. He bends down, and never forget his ears are so big when he bends down, they go forward. I'm serious. And he bent down, I saw an ear go forward, and he picked up a shell and he said, What are you doing anyway? That's all he said. And the Holy Spirit of God come down on me and convicted me like I hadn't felt in many, many years. I didn't answer him. I didn't say a word. He never said another word. He spent the night at my house. He left the next morning, and when he did, I fell on my knees and faced before God, and I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. It's like I'm just out here running around, you know, chasing rabbits. I don't know what I'm doing. And God said, it's time for you to get back in the game. Get back in the game. How many people you think have died without my son because you're laying down here, and you think you're doing some good by feeding the same people over and over? Get back in the game. Get back to soul winning. Get back to witnessing. Get back out there. So out of nowhere, I just put out on Facebook or something. I said, I'm going to start a Bible study in my house. My house wasn't much bigger than a fourth of this, this sanctuary. 32 people showed up the first day. And it started snowballing and rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. Until then, in 2013, the Baptist came to me and said, we want to start a set-free church in Daytona Beach. And we heard you started a set free church in Kentucky. And I did. I started my pastor for 12 years. Would you like to do this? And I said, I don't know. Let me pray about it. Lord, okay. Amen. You've done those nose pinching prayers before because you knew it was of God. And so here we go, man. I'm reared up, ready to go back into, into the ministry and, and pastoring. And so I had these 32 people, and I was also doing a Bible study on the tiki bar of a local bar there in Port Orange, Florida. And I had about 10 or 12 guys, and I'm ready to go, and I'm ready to do all this, right? And I get back to where I need to be, and I'm preaching, and, and I go to some of these conferences, and I'm seeing, and I'm seeing these guys in the pulpit. What are they saying? I'm not, Bianca says, well, I don't think that's right, do you? And I said, well, I know it's not right. What are they saying? And you've got all these big mega church pastors out there amen, in this guy. And this guy's not preaching the Word of God. And so I start thinking, boy, if Adrian Rogers is here, he'd call that dude out. If Jack Howes is here, he'd call that guy out. If Jerry Falwell was still alive, he'd call this guy out. 
these men, we call these men out, what has happened? I'm going to tell you what's happened. We've tolerated sin in the church for too long. That's exactly what it is. We don't want to call out sin. We don't want to talk about sin. I tell you what, if they're, most of the time, if they're 35 years down to about 20 years old, they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about it. My own children. All right, they'll say, Daddy, why, why are you talking about homosexuality all the time? I said, because it's an abomination to God. But, Daddy, you know, we've got some classmates and class, you know, I don't hate them. I'm not saying I would be mean to them. I would never be mean to someone like that. Now, some guy comes up and lays his hand on me and tries to kiss me, it may be a different story, amen? I'm not messing with that stuff. But I, they come to me, and so my own children, they have a tolerance to sin. We just, more sin is okay. Well, what's wrong with this? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's wrong. The Bible speaks against it. And see, these guys are preaching grace. They're not preaching truth. I'll close out. John chapter 8. I don't know if it was a setup deal or not. All the theologians said that it was. They said these men set this woman up for her to commit adultery with another man. And all we know is now all these men have brought this lady. The pictures depict her as clothed in a sheet. Some say she was totally naked. I don't know. They said they brought her there to stone her to death. You, you know the story. And, and, and some of my liberal friends always use this verse. He that had no sin, let him cast the first stone. Read the, whole, read the whole thing. Never take a text out of context. Amen? We're, just, we're, we're supposed to have some righteous judgment about us too. Amen? If you see a brother and sister that's living in sin, you should call them out on it. Amen? And, and so here they are. And so Jesus is now, he's down writing in the ground. We're all trying to figure out what he wrote. Nobody knows. The Bible don't say so. All I know is, is he looked up and he said, Hey, sister, where's all those who condemned you? And he said, They're gone. She said, They're gone. They're not here anymore. I mean, you can read a lot into that. But here's what I want you to read into it. He said, Well, neither do I condemn you. That's grace. Naked, laying before a crowd of men with rocks in her hand ready to stone her, she apparently did commit the act She's right there, and he says, where are your condemners? They're gone. Oh, I don't condemn you either. That's grace, amen? That's grace. We are saved by grace, and we are kept saved by grace, amen? But what else did he say? But go and sin no more. Well, Joel, you're not saying that. Amen? You're leaving that part out. Well, what's going on there, Steve? How come you're not preaching that part, Steve? You're saying, come get in the grace of God, but why don't you go tell them, don't go and sin no more? I'll tell you why. Because then, these things right here get very light when you preach that. Yeah, it's not as stacked as high when you preach on that. And see, then you can't live in a 1.5 million mansion. You can't drive the Bentleys and the Hollies. You can't, you can't go out and, and eat an $85 per person meal two or three times a week. You can't do all of that when this is light. And what makes this light is when you go and say, go and sin no more. But it's the Word of God. Not Cochise's Word. Not anybody else's Word. It's God's Word spoke from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So you know what that is? That's grace and that's truth. The problem is, these guys I'm talking about, and let me tell you what this one young man in South Carolina did. You know what he did? Not only as he preached the modern gospel, he took his baptistries, and he took like four or five of these baptistries just like this, and he took them out in a parking lot of his church, and he bought 1,000 T-shirts. They said, I got baptized at so-and-so Baptist church or just so-and-so church. And he's bringing people in off the street, grabbing the homeless guys, the hookers, and everything else. He said, you like to have a free T-shirt? Well, yeah. Well, come on up here and let us baptize, and you got one. And bragged, we baptized 600 people yesterday. No, you got 600 people wet's what you did. And you confuse them and you fool them now to think that they are secure in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and they're not, they're lost. It's all grace and no truth. But on the other hand, now you remember me mentioning a guy named Jack House? You remember Jack House, First Baptist Church, Hammond, Indiana, independent Baptist guy? For example, like now, if he's looking around and saw one of y'all nodding, he'd come back there to you. Peck you on the head. Wake up. You kids couldn't make a noise back there. 
Straighten up back. I mean, he was hard, dude. I mean, he was all truth, 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 truth. That's all he hit you with, with truth. There was never any grace. So what's, it's got to be a fine line, brothers and sisters. Grace and truth. Grace is God loves you. Truth is don't keep on living in that sin like that. Don't keep on doing the things that you do. There's my enemy. That's the reason why motorcycle ministers don't like me. Motorcycle, Christian motorcycle clubs, they don't like me. That's the reason why a lot of pastors don't like me. Because I call them out on nonsense from the pulpit. I know, you say, well, brother, I thought you was a biker or a motorcycle ministry. You know what motorcycle ministries? Those dudes don't even go to church. They don't go to church. They have a Bible study in their bylaws. They've got to have one Bible study a month. That's their church. I got one bird down there in, in Florida. You know where he goes to church? You know where he goes on Sunday mornings? He goes to the local one percenters clubhouse and drinks beer with them at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. I said, why are you doing that? He said, that's my church time. Dude, read the Bible. Separate yourself from them people. Be a witness. What happens when a lost guy walks in there and sees you with that Christian motorcycle patch on your back and see the one percenter patch over here? They can't tell the difference between you and them. Come on now. So, I don't know if the Muslims like me or not, or the is uh, ISIS. I like that joke personally. You know, if some people had their way, they wouldn't be ISIS. They'd be was was. Amen. So is is was was. That's what Mr. Trump wants to do, I think. But was was is is. Did you get that? ISIS is is. Uh, Putin's trying to make them was was. Amen. I don't know who that likes me. I don't consider myself a warrior. I just do what God wants me to do. But the people don't like me are the people who stand behind that pulpit right there. And I don't, you know, it bothers me sometimes. I speak Tuesday night at one of our associational meetings, and they never come out and tell me, but it, honestly, they tell me sometimes, you need to chill, it, chill out a little bit, brother. You know, calm it down a little bit. I'm going to say what God wants me to say. And if I got to take heat over it, I'll take the heat over it. The truth of the matter is, God loves you. His grace endures forever. We are saved by grace. Amen. We're kept saved by His grace. Every time I mess up, thank God, man, I can come to Him for grace. The truth of it is, you need to quit sinning. You need to stop what you're doing. It's wrong. If you're committing adultery, you can't, you can't, Baby cake powder coat that. If you're committing fornication, you're wrong. If you're a drunkard, you're wrong. If you're doing illegal drugs, you're wrong. If you're doing legal drugs wrongly, you're wrong. I know this pastor here preaches that, but a lot of people don't hear it. You're wrong. If you hate somebody, you're wrong. Especially somebody in the household of faith, you're wrong. If you have an unforgiving spirit, you're wrong. Amen? If you're holding grudges, you're wrong. Amen? If you lie, you're wrong. If you're stealing, you're wrong. If you're cheating, you're wrong. You're wrong. Repent or perish. God bless you, my brother. We're going to take a break here in a few minutes. I'm going to have to share something with you. That was powerful. You know, I thought about sin. How many times does it uh, say sin in the Bible? It's, have you Googled it? I just Googled it earlier. It's over 400 times. I picked up a book on my shelf. I've got a lot of books at my house. I picked up a... Did I, did I die? I'm alive with Jesus.